So my name is uh, Thomas Prime and I work at the National Ocean Oak Centre and um, I was, my role in this has been to create a framework using um, Gabby's uh, scripts that she's sort of already demonstrated to you and other bits and pieces to uh, make an operational sargassum forecast um, product um, or system. So I just got a very quick overline of what I'm going to cover. Um, Gabby's kind of covered a fair bit of it already, so I'm sorry if I end up repeating myself a little. Um, so there's the sargassum framework, so sort of why, why, what am I doing, why, why am I doing it? Um, a very quick discussion about the Nemo surge model. Uh, I mean, Gabby kind of covered it a little bit, but I'll talk a bit more specifically. Um, the satellite products, uh, again, I'll be more specific, <laughs> slightly more specific, I guess. And then the particle tracking uh, module. And then uh, I'm going to talk about the technical aspects. Um, so I'm quite glad in the poll earlier that the fair number of you are technical and you're also interested in sargassum. So this hopefully won't be uh, too boring. Um, and yeah, so I cover all the stages used there uh, that I undertook there to try and make this uh, operational. So what Gabby showed you earlier was a you know a simple I say simple but the a linear script that you execute yourself. So just take that, add all the other bits and pieces you need, and make it run itself. Um, it's a gist. Um, so you saw this graphic earlier. Um, there is um, several components uh, that is part of the system. So you have the atmospheric, can you see my mouse? I'm not sure if you can. Uh, there's the atmospheric forecasting uh, model, the uh, NEMA model, and the, sorry, just gonna switch on a pointer, makes it a bit easier. So you've got the atmospheric forecasting that acts as an input, the, the NEMO surge model that gives you the forecast current data, the sargassium, satellite products that give you the locations and then you put that into the particle tracking model so very similar to what um, you just did in the in the in the scripts earlier but with the extra step, steps of making an operational set of currents rather than a high cast or a high cast data set um, so the operational framework um, since it's something ideal you'd have minimal oversight on it needs to be robust so it needs to work um, and deal with common errors like say um, the forecasting data not being there or um, uh, something something happens uh, the the sargassum scripts are gone or something so it needs to be able to cope with um, issues um, and if it can't cope with an issue it needs to fail in a nice clear clear way so um, it doesn't just give you a load of random uh, errors it actually says this is what's wrong um, uh, you've also built it to be a modular so this is actually based on a a framework I built a few years ago, which is just a, a Nemo uh, surge model. So that was predicting storm surge um, around uh, Madagascar. So this would run operationally and spit out a load of um, plots um, for you. Um, so uh, I've basically built on top of that. I made that initially uh, modular. So I've been able to build and add in the sargassum and the particle tracking stages to it, basically. Um, and the idea is also to make it portable. So much like what Gabby was uh, has shown you, you want to be able to make it so someone can take this and use it without too much hassle. So you haven't got to spend your time compiling the model. You haven't got to spend your time um, against getting all the dependencies, all the libraries together, the system. You can enter a few commands and it should be there ready to go, um, which is the theory. Um, at the bottom down here, you can see there's the. this is where the code currently is. Um, it's not in the main repository in the sense of um, on NOC or on the main, even on the main um, thread of the, of the repository, because it's still very much a work in progress. But if you're really keen, you can you can download it and give it a go. There are some basic instructions. Um, so that leads on to being easy to use. So it needs to be something that people can use without too much too much hassle. You know, I don't want to be a meteorologist or an oceanographer to, have to be able to use it. It should be someone with some technical capabilities, but not, um, not PhD level. Um, and again, it needs to be quite easy to monitor. So in the sense of, you know, what you can see what's happening because all this stuff will be running in the background on your computer. It's helpful to know what's going on. And then I was going for lots of ease. So I only managed four in the end, um, but expandable, easy to modify. So again, sort of what I've already done is this system is something you can inherently build and do more things with. There we go. Um, so, the Nemo surge model. Uh, you can see, hopefully, this GIF is um, GIFing for you, and you can see 
um, water levels swirling around Madagascar. So this is the output from the original framework I built, or one of the outputs. And you can see um, the water levels going around um, around uh, the island of Madagascar. Um, it was built using code, uh, MIMO surge uh, model code. This is different to the main branch of MIMO, which is an ocean model, 3D ocean model. This is a, a two-dimensional um, biotropic surge model. So it is a slight different uh, implementation. Um, it was originally, I mean, I hope I'm, I'm right on this, but it was originally developed by in the UK by the Met Office, or at least in conjunction with the Met Office to replace the existing storm surge model. Um, I think they're about to start using it in, in its entirety. So for a number of years, they've been running the old system with the new one, this new Nemo surge. Um, and I think this year they're changing it over to just be running Nemo. So it's a well-tested and validated set of codes. So, you know, confident it's not going to produce rubbish. Um, and the, and the, there's been different configurations that have been adapted around the world. So there's one for Madagascar, which you can see here. And there's also one now for um, Belize and there's some in other places too. Um, so this is the model. Um, this will produce the currents um, that Gabby mentioned earlier. Um, so rather than having one big lump my hand cast, this will produce our um, data set of five days into the future um, with currents that you can then track particles with. Okay. Um, so this is a this is the image of the Sargassian product that it uses. So the framework goes and gets the latest um, seven day density um, forecast for the region. Um, you can see here that the the, the blocks, the, the, depending on the colour of the blocks, depends how much sargassium it's seen. So um, it's quite nice that um, sargassium is quite easy to spot in satellite images if they're using infrared because it, um, it's very distinct from seawater. Um, and the framework I've built um, downloads the latest seven day composite. So you, you get rid of as much clouds as you can. You can see there's not too many clouds in that image. Um, and then it uses uh, basically the script, a part of the script that Gabby was showing earlier to determine locations of high or lots of um, sargassium. And then these seed locations are then prepared ready for the for the particle tracker, particle tracking module to use. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit, but uh, hopefully it's, it's still interesting. Um, so Gabby's already mentioned this uh, once, but the module that we use, there's lots of options to use. And I went for um, uh, ocean parcels, mostly because it works directly with the Nemo output. You can effectively feed it straight in. You haven't got to play about with it to make it work and it makes it more and more robust as I was using for robustness. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we covered it earlier, but you know, it can track act passively in active particles. Um, it can it can do all sorts of things. Um, so essentially, you feed it the current data from Nemo and your seed locations, and out pop um, your trajectories that you then can plot. So that's the idea. Um, so the idea is I combine those three of well, actually more components, but those three main components so, um, together to make a system that can uh, produce nice. Interesting plots, hopefully. Um, so don't worry, don't worry too much about the scripts or the script on the side. It's just when you're talking about Docker and containers and and things like this, there's not really much pictures you can show. Um, so the the steps to make it portable and robust required it to be easy and also easy to set up required um, the model to be easy to set up, which is quite difficult. To set up Nemo, you need to um, compile, you need to know the architecture of the computer you're on, you need to um, download various different packages and libraries, compile those, and then um, uh, be able, you know, compile those, then compile the model and compile all sorts of different things. So it's not at all user friendly. So the steps we've been taking recently is to um, containerize the model. So the end user doesn't actually need to do any of that, they can just literally pull a container from a repository online and um, it, it, and, and have a working model. Um, the script you can see there is just uh, the state starts of the stages that you need to, to build. So you run this what's called a Docker file, and then at the end you get a binary um, blob for what, um, a blind blob image that you can run a container from. So the binary blob image contains um, all the all the the model, all the libraries, everything you need. Um, and so all you have to do is give it a folder with um, the, the forcing data, the um, bits and pieces that Nemo needs to run operationally. So um, you know, the actual time and date you want to run, that kind of thing. <laughs> and it will run and produce the outputs um, for you to then utilize. Um, 
it's also this sort of system is quite nice because essentially you just have to download it so you don't even have to um uh install um the model um, if you have docker installed um it will the system will automatically pull the image and um, that it needs from the online from the repositories and, and run it so it's um it makes it very user friendly um it also means you can run more than one model at once i mean it's it, it makes it simpler because you just have separate folders for a different ensemble of model runs so say you wanted to use different sets of four scenes or um slightly different time periods or different parameters or whatever you can you can you can do that it's not supporting this framework i built so the framework just runs it can only support and run one container at once um and it's um and uh, just uh, and just uses that it can't it, it's only used to it's only going to support for one container and at the moment the containers has to be built for each nemo configuration so you can go ahead and download the container the information's on in the repository I put and early in it there's also the information how to build containers um, but you'd have to change the configuration so you can see here for example the name of the container is Belize Surge and this is a Nemo Surge specific container so if you wanted a 3D uh, Nemo model you'd have to build a different container so there's several different containers you can build so for this one I built one for, for the area around Belize um, and using the search Nemo Surge code um, so the user could um, change make some change or, or provide a new model configuration file so the grid so you know the new grid files and stuff, so you could build a new a new um configuration if you wanted um so that's the model so the model is um it's actually wrapped up in a in a in a, in a, in a container and it just uh, if you have docker installed you can run it so effectively you can go docker run my container here's the files you need go and um, it'll produce the output the current output um and then the same for you could then take Gabby's script and then modify it slightly and just click through and get your, you know, tell her here's the output for the Nemo, here's uh here's a sargassum thing you want, go, 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 and it produces what you want. Um, but that's not very good operationally. You don't want to be sat there every day going and uh, waiting for it to happen and waiting for it to do things because I mean the, the model runs take take hours as well. So you have to sit there waiting for it to happen, you know, download the weather. Um, download new weather, download new Sargassium, and then do that. So um, to make it operational, you need to have a series of um, of of, um, of what I've called what I've turned workers. So there's a number of jobs that need to be undertaken, and I've written a Python script, uh, which is I've called a worker to undertake each individual job, and then it reports back saying yes, I did it. Um, go on to the next one, or I, I, I've I've run successfully, and then the next worker goes, oh, okay, I can do my job now. And so they run at regular intervals, um, doing their different roles. So you can see there's a whole list of stuff it needs to do. Um, so every day there's new atmospheric forcing, um, so it goes and downloads that. And then needs to convert that into new input, so the next worker does that. Um, you need to start the model container, <coughs> so the model, the, that one does that, so it preps all the files you need to do that. And then you know, it actually starts the container itself. Um, and since the container is actually independent of the of the Python process, um, you uh, you have a watch um, script as well. So it sits and watches the container and then QAs the output to make sure there's no errors. And then you um, have a second um, worker that gets the uh, second input data, which is the Sargassian ones. That runs every day and gets new Sargassian data. And then it, this is where Gabby's, this is basically where I've operationalized Gabby's script. So it goes and finds locations, runs the open pass, um, Ocean parcels um, module and then plots it into a onto a map, and then finally there's a cleanup um, uh, cleanup worker. Like make sure you don't end up with lots of log files and output files scattered everywhere because they will overwhelm your system eventually if you don't keep an eye on them. Um, so the reasoning behind all this is it makes it nice and modular. All these all these scripts are independent, so you can actually just run them independently, and they don't rely on each other. Um, and the environment they you run them from. So, as Gary mentioned earlier, you use a Miniconda or Anaconda. So, if you have that installed, you can then essentially use a, a configuration file that tells you these are the modules or libraries or toolboxes, however you want to describe them, that I need to go and install them. And it goes and installs them, and all these all these processes will automatically should automatically run in theory. <laughs> um, and then each each uh, worker will check. Um, that it's um, that the previous one was successful or not. Um, so um, yeah, so that's all the different workers. They all do their jobs, and it makes it easy to expand. So you, you know, for example, you I've got a plot tracks worker. You could add on an extra one saying um, 
I want to plot this, that, and the other. Or you could add different sargassum products in there. So as I mentioned earlier, you could actually have several different runs and go to get different sargassum products and things. Yeah, as, a, as an idea of expanding this, this is still quite a simple, simple process. Um, so yeah, uh, so as I was sort of saying, it's still a very manual in the sense that, you, okay, you've now got your workers, but you'd have to execute them one by one, wait for one to finish and then run the other one as that stood. So you also need a manager process um, or what's known as a process manager. And this is something that will start and stop processes. And um, there's lots of options you can use. I did originally try to write a Python script to do this, um, but it, it was quite it was quite brittle and prone to falling over because you, 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 your system can sometimes stop or start. And this, this makes sure um, that there's that all different processes, all different workers are running and starting as they should. It also, ha also has logging um, uh, capabilities, which is quite nice. So rather than having to try and work some sort of centralized logging thing with the workers, all you do, the workers just print out their statements. So you can run that from the command line and then this will um, save those in logs. So you can look for the logs and make sure everything's working fine. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And so you can see, you can see here, so you go, the actual process manager is called PM2, which I assume means process manager two. Um, and you say start, and this this file basically, which is in the repository, um, tells tells you what processes to start, how often to, to restart them, and what commands they need and things. So you can see, oh, it's realized none of things running, so it starts all the processes up here. And um, you can see here that all the status they're online and what memory they're taking up and what CPU. So they They've literally just started, so they've got no CPU and they're taking up small amounts of memory. Um, and, and there's also some modules you can install that to help maintain the logs and things. Um, so that, pro that, that process manager, you could just, in theory, you could just go start and just leave it. In theory, it should print and um, produce plots every 24 hours um, for you. Um, obviously, it'd be nice to know what's happening, what's going on, is it actually working? Um, so you can do that using the monitoring tools that the process manager provides. So another reason why I wanted to use them is because rather than trying to figure out or come my own system that tells you, it was easier to um, and more more robust to use something that's already existing. Um, so there's a what's called the process monitoring dashboard, um, fancy title, and you can see. I'm not sure how well these these these. Um, these, this text comes up, but you can see is each all the processes that I've started. So, you know, you've got download weather, which is the one highlighted in blue. And you can see that one's online, that one's running. So on the first start, that one will always run first. And um, because all the others will go, oh, can I have got anything to do? And they go, no, so they'll they'll stop running. So download weather goes, oh, I'll go and download some weather. And you can look at the logs. So this is saying, oh, it's entering a log saying um, that it's <coughs> found the, however many of the forecast files. So in this case, it's downloading hourly um, data. So there's 120 hours worth of data. So then um, in, well, as I mentioned earlier, it makes, to make it robust, it goes and goes, is that data there? Okay. Uh, once it's checked all the data there, then goes and downloads it, which, which takes longer, but it's, um, you know, rather than say a few minutes, it takes 10 minutes. Um, but it means it, um, you're more, you're more, you're more um, confident that it's not gonna have issues. Like if there's a forecast, but I'm missing and the model will just sit there and grind to a halt or crash. It'd be a bit confusing as to what actually happens. You won't, you won't be so clear. So this is some of the steps you use to um, try and um, make sure that you can um, you can download and or keep on running. So as I mentioned earlier, the containers are um, separate to the Python system. So they're running um, within Docker, or the, the system actually supports several different frameworks. Um, one called Pobble, which is very similar to Docker. Um, and you basically can check the, what containers are running by uh, this web browser part, this web browser bit here, um, where it will show you what containers are running. So you can see here, um, there's a container running right now, which is why well, it's not right now. When I took the screenshot, this container. Um, I'm not sure, I, you can't really read the text because I can barely read it, but it tells you the name of the container. So you can see, oh, my search container is running. It's using 96% of the CPU. So obviously, because models are using lots of, it must have just started, so it's not using any memory yet. So it hasn't actually loaded the data in memory yet. And you can see it's running. Um, and then underneath, you can have a list of images. So um, when you pull from the repository, you have an image which you build. You can also build if you want to, but you can pull from the repository. 
you uh, and then you run containers from that image to the images and then a base and you uh, run on top of it basically uh, and you could administer from here as well so you can start and stop the containers and get them from the repository if you wanted so docker does it automatically when you ask for it it will search your containers and uh, your container repository list and things um so yeah that's the that's the monitor side of things. So this allows you to be a bit more relatively confident what's going on. You can see it'll also show error logs. So if there's an error, it'll go, oh, there's an error. You can figure out what's going on. Um, um, so the idea would be you would um, be able to check what's happening and uh, and keep an eye on it. So you know, looking daily or something um, like that. Okay, um, so hopefully that wasn't all too boring um the output the whole point of all that is essentially you go um you go install anaconda you still install um docker you build the python environment then you go and install pm2 and then you click just go start and it should or if everything <laughs> works it should all just start off on its own um put these and then these outputs um uh should appear well uh the the map output should appear so at the moment the framework only produ it produces a map of the of the of the region the model simulated and plots the forecast tracks so uh since it's only five days the tracks are much shorter than the ones gabby is showing which are you know a month's worth but you can see here for example this is where the particle started and five days later it's projected to be here you can see this is from last night so this is the image and that's produced this morning when i when I um when I got up, so I've stuck it in the spreadsheets. Um and you can see the, the forecast tracks are sargassum. So each of these points is somewhere where the um the the find uh, the find the locations script that uh, the find and see location script in the sargassum product is found, and then that's where the currents have pushed that those particles to. Um so that is the current outputs. Uh it's I'm open to having feedback and what what people are looking for because at the moment it's just very much to demonstrate what they can do, um, and this is why I also put this um, graph on as well. So um, while I haven't actually implemented this in this in this version, and the previous framework I built it was Storm Surge only, so it outputted um, sea surface heights, and then if it was above a certain threshold, um, it would produce a warning. So the idea was you could set a load of locations, you know, areas around, in this case, it's Madagascar, and say, um, warn me if the surge is going to be above whatever value you feel like, so half a meter in this case. Um, and you can see, so this is something that could be added. I mean, it's not, so the, the idea is, you, you, is this system could be added to and built up um, to do multiple tasks if um, if there's interest in that. Um, and then finally, I thought, well, <laughs> since an operational tool, I should really show more data. So that was um, this, mor this morning's data. And these are the last few days of data. So you can see um, there are changes, particularly between the, the I can't actually see the most people. Uh, the, these two images here, there's quite a big change. So there's a, uh, the Sargassum data updates. I believe updates daily, um, but I think it's a seven, I'm not sure, it's a seven day composite. So I'm not sure if it's a rolling average composite or, our, um, or, or something that changes every seven days. But either way, you, this is a daily thing at the moment. So it will produce a, a forecast product for every day. Um, and at the moment, the tracks, I'm, hoping, I'm not sure if the tracks are um, appropriate yet, because at the moment, the model is um, starting from cold every day. So um, what I mean by that is it starts um, um, from still, and then it will eventually, um, and then as, the, as, you, as you force the model, it will move the water around. So ideally, what happens is Nemo restarts, uses a restart file every night, which does work. Um, but I haven't implemented. So hopefully in the next week, when I've implemented that properly, you'll have even better tracks. Um, but that's it. Um, that's pretty much everything I want to talk about. Um, any feedback would be great because I'm very much building this about really knowing what people are actually looking for. So um, any feedback.